Hello everyone, welcome to Mana Plus, the all-in-one gaming channel. Once again, it's me, your host and channel owner. In the previous video, I analyzed a part of the Shadow of the Erdtree trailer and proposed hypotheses about the geographical location of the Land of Shadow, the Dying Giant Tree, the Looming Veils in the Sky, and the first NPCs appearing in the trailer, including speculations about their backgrounds. Today, on a cold, rainy evening in the city where I live, having just finished work at the factory and returned home, I embark on creating this next video. Perhaps the simple life of a worker has afforded me some spare time to pursue my modest passions. The next topic I want to delve into and present my hypotheses for discussion revolves around a temple and the omen in the shadow of the Erdtree DLC, which we had the opportunity to glimpse through a trailer lasting over three minutes. Initially, I was eager to create a video analyzing the character Mesmer, but it seems there are some details I need to verify, so I'll save that topic for another occasion. Now, I invite you to follow along as I analyze the lands of the Omen based on my observations from the over 3-minute trailer that From Software has provided us. Now, perhaps I should start with this frame, as it can be considered a very special frame as it contains within it a rather large complex structure and is the subject of this segment of the trailer. First, in terms of the overall view, this structure appears to be built on the flat surface of an inverted cone-shaped mountain, or more accurately, it is upside down compared to normal. In my memory, I have hardly ever seen such a geological formation in the lands between, except for one place, which is Liurnia of the Lake, and the mountain used to construct the Raya Lucaria Academy also has a similar shape. Logically, traditional mountains or mountain ranges mostly have shapes similar to pyramids or triangles when drawn on a flat surface, but here it seems that the mountain used to build this structure is seemingly inverted, with the pointed peak pointing downwards. If you pay attention, it seems that not only this largest mountain but also around the area in this segment of the trailer, there are appearances of similar but smaller geological formations. For example, here, this small peak seems to be crafted from a column of ancient ruins. These ancient columns are not rare in the original game, you can encounter them almost everywhere, from Limgrave to mountaintop of the giants, and some of these columns are even used as the foundation for the giant's forge. In another scene of the trailer, in the snippet where the advertising buddy is throwing bombs at the bandits, whom I believe are Mesmer soldiers guarding the entrance to a certain area, and I'll talk about them another time. Returning to this scene, the mountain behind them also has a similar geographical shape of an inverted peak, and it's easy to understand that this inverted part of the mountain probably shares the same territory as the structure I'm analyzing. But what does this mean? I think this structure or rather this land, if not built from those ancient giant columns, is also floating in the sky. Now, let's dive deeper into analyzing this structure. First, its layout is rather straightforward. Since the trailer doesn't provide a clear division of its ground plan into areas, I'll divide its vertical aspect into three parts for easier analysis. At the bottom, we have the first tier, which serves as the base of the structure. The second tier comprises towers and rooftops, while the third tier consists of a complex of earth, rocks, tree branches, and even rocks seemingly suspended in mid-air. Firstly, we can see that this structure seems to have only one approach, which is the solitary path here, right in front of the entrance to the structure, making it almost entirely separated from the surrounding lands. Its strategic location makes it easy to fortify against hostile forces and avoid prying eyes, perhaps suggesting that the builders of this structure foresaw its fate, that it would undergo a war in the future? Thinking about this, I am reminded of the astrologers in the original game, who built the Raya Lucaria Academy, and very likely this structure as well. Remember that the astrologers in Elden Ring are those who read the fate of the stars, and have the ability to establish themselves in mountaintops that nearly touch the sky. Of course, there is almost no evidence to confirm this at the moment, with the only clue being that the sky in the Land of Shadow has no stars, at least within the range of the trailer that has been shown. So, it's better to shift the focus to another area here. Right here, there is a gleaming golden hue covering the ground, reminding me of the poison swamps in the original game. However, 
The area of this swamp is relatively small, and if you look closely, there are traces of it on the geological layers above as well. Essentially, with the similar color, it's hard to think of an answer other than poison swamp, but besides that, I also notice it looks quite similar to the golden resin of the dying giant tree, raising the question of whether that tree is related to this structure. I think it is, and it's also worth mentioning that the NPC friend holding the jar is sitting right here, in the area with this gleaming golden hue. Perhaps he is harvesting it, and the jar in his hand is to contain this golden liquid substance? Now, take a look at these spiraling grouped columns, known as the Solomonic Columns. I've explained the origins of these columns in the previous video, so I won't go over it again here, and you can find the link to that video in the description. But essentially, these types of columns often appear in religious and beliefs architectural structures, and some in structures that represent power and authority. A prime example is their appearance at the giant serpent shrine in Volcano Manor. The presence of these columns at the entrance of a structure suggests that the structure is likely a religious and belief site, and of course, you can also expect to find them inside this structure. Therefore, I believe this structure serves both as a religious or site and as a defensive fortress of a faction in the Land of Shadow. In terms of scale, I estimate the size and exploratory content of this structure to be similar to Stormvale Castle or even larger. Furthermore, if you pay attention to the reliefs appearing above the gate's wall, I'm fairly certain this structure is a temple, likely designed by From Software based on inspiration from the Sun Temple in India, a structure with decorative reliefs bearing many similarities. In terms of form, reliefs depicting human figures depicting saints or everyday human activities like this often appear on altars or temples. You can see them at Siofa River or Mogwin Palace and many other places in the lands between. And another factor proving that this structure is a temple is these towers. Clearly, they can be seen as advantageous high points for defensive purposes, but the defense aspect likely belongs to the lower towers attached to the lower walls. Furthermore, you can also find these towers in many places, specifically in the towns in the Land of Shadow. Additionally, in terms of form, they bear many similarities to the minaret towers in Islamic architecture. Just search on google.com to find out what minaret towers are. In terms of purpose, these towers serve as prayer locations, where Muslims ascend to pray at each dawn. What's especially noteworthy is that the windows of these tower bodies are mostly designed to face the sun at sunrise or sunset to create the effect of light shining into the tower. Therefore, the appearance of these tower types within this structure truly leaves me with no doubt that it is a religious structure, or more accurately, a temple. So, if it's a temple, who or what is it dedicated to? And if it's also a fortress, who does it belong to? Furthermore, the line, they were never saints spoken by the female NPC in this segment, who is she referring to? I'll try to answer these questions in the later part of this video. Now, if you find this interesting, please give me a subscribe, like, or share it with your friends, or if possible, leave a generous comment below the comment section. Your support will be a great motivation for me to continue creating better quality videos in the future, serving you with more entertaining and thoughtful content. So, before moving on to the next part of the video, perhaps I should present my hypothesis about the gate of this temple. If you notice, on the surface of the gate of this temple, there are some patterns, which look quite faint due to the limited resolution of the trailer, but they could possibly be glowing inscriptions similar to the inscriptions on the commemorative plaques we saw at Siofa River. This leads me to believe that this gate seems to have been sealed, similar to the gates of Raya Lucaria Academy or Langdal Capital, forcing us to complete a certain task to obtain the key or to take a detour through other areas before being able to teleport inside the temple. Do you remember the bell tower similar to the ones at the four belfries in Liurnia that I mentioned in the previous video? It's highly likely that this bell tower in the Land of Shadow will take you to a small area, especially with a beautiful view of this temple, similar to teleporting from the four belfries to Faramazula. Now, let's move on to another scene from the trailer, with the main setting of this scene right inside the temple. It's one of the most impressive scenes for me, and of course, that's the scene where our advertising buddy is being tortured by the boss lion dancer. 
In fact, even though it's just a short 10-second snippet, it holds a lot of information that allows us to learn more about the history, culture, and society, even the lore of the Land of Shadow. In this first image, the camera angle presents three particularly noteworthy elements. Firstly, the mouth of the lion model. Secondly, the hand of the person pushing into the lion's mouth. And thirdly, the piece of jewelry worn around the lion's neck. I'll talk about the lion later, for now, let's focus on this person's hand. It's difficult to say it belongs to any species other than a human. However, what's even more peculiar is that the fingernails of this hand look very similar to the nails or hands of Mesmer. Of course, Messer cannot be here performing as a lion for us to see, and I've searched for characters with similar nails to Mesmer in the original game. From Morgoth to Mog, from Godfrey to Kenneth Haight, or even the old lady finger reader sitting at round table hold, none of them have nails resembling those of the lion dancer or Mesmer in this trailer. If there were, perhaps only Rikard's hand would resemble Mesmer's, but even then, we can't draw any conclusions. Therefore, I won't delve deeper into this, but the similarity of the nails of this hand to Mesmer's is undeniable, and is Mesmer someone like them? This question, for the time being, I cannot answer immediately. Now let's look at this image in the next scene, perhaps this is the appropriate image to talk more about this lion model as well as the jewelry it wears. First, let's analyze this lion model. In terms of appearance, it's quite different from Sirosh or the blade lions we've encountered in the original game. The most significant difference here is that its face looks quite human, especially with the flat teeth typically seen in humans or anthropoid primates. This is not surprising as this creature is an omen, you can see the horns growing from its body, and although this is a model used by dancers inside to perform lion dance, I believe it was once a living creature and may have been skinned and turned into a dance model after death. As we know, the crucible is primal life that once existed in the lands between before the age of Erdtree, and in the age of the crucible, life or creatures seem to intertwine with each other. Therefore, it's not unusual for an omen lion to have the facial features or teeth of a human. And what about its eyes? They seem to be made of two green-colored stones and look very vivid. Indeed, its eyes seem to possess some sort of magic that brings life to this lion model, extremely lifelike. As we know, the magical stones or powers in the original game are glint stones, but green glint stones resembling the eyes of this lion are quite rare in the game. We can only identify some types of glint stones with similar colors on a few items, such as a livinous glint stone crown, twinsage glint stone crown, or witch's glint stone crown. All these items share certain common points, such as belonging to a witch or having the ability to enhance intelligence while reducing the HP or stamina of the user. For example, the Olivenous Glintstone crown has eyes identical to this lion's, so it's highly likely that this lion dancer boss will also have high intelligence but low HP. However, the person who made this lion model is likely a witch, and they placed two green Glintstone stones in its eyes to create a more lifelike model. Here I just remembered that the hairstyle of this lion model looks very similar to something that I almost forgot to mention to you. As we know, From Software is very adept at creating characters and related elements that bear a resemblance to each other in form or concept, showing a significant coherence between them. For example, Godfrey's head looks very similar to the Watchtowers of Stormvale, or the armor set of Character D is inspired by a pair of twin brothers, and in fact, Character D also has a twin brother, and so on. And of course, the hairstyle of this lion model bears a striking resemblance to something very important that I will tell you about later. So, let's keep watching this video to find out what that is. Now let's shift our focus to the armor pieces that this lion model is wearing, as they contain many symbols related to natural elements such as the sun, stars, and they may provide us with a more comprehensive view of the religious culture in the past of the Land of Shadow as well as the lands between. First, let's look at position number 5, the abdominal armor piece of this lion. On this piece, there are two easily recognizable symbols with a circle in the middle representing the shining sun and two symbols on the sides representing clouds, I'm quite sure about their depiction, 
Regarding the sun imagery, it appears almost everywhere in the land between as well as in this very temple. But there's one very important item that I can't overlook, and that's the telescope. The body of this telescope is decorated with not just one but two areas bearing symbols of the sun. The item is described as follows, astrology tool used by members of the Carrion royal family. A stolen part of a larger instrument. Allows the viewer to better see faraway things. During the age of the Ur tree, Carrion astrology withered on the vine, the fate once writ in the night skies had been fettered by the Golden Order. So, we can believe that the sun motifs here serve as symbols of the Golden Order. Additionally, you can find many sunflower symbols at Faramazula, a place of dragon worship and also a symbol of the covenant, of friendship between humans and dragons after the war between the two species. Therefore, a lion adorned with sun symbols represents an ancient deity that was once worshipped or may also represent the Golden Order. It's worth noting that in another scene of the video, we can see this lion dancer boss using lightning bolts of yellow color, similar to the magic of the ancient dragon cult. Of course, the lion model itself cannot use this lightning magic, so I believe these yellow lightning bolts belong to the dancers inside the lion model. This is crucial because it provides us with information that these lion dancers may have been warriors serving the Golden Order and, of course, they were also warriors of the ancient dragon cult in the past. As for the shoulder armor of this lion, its decorative patterns are quite similar to those on the abdominal armor, such as the sun, meteorites, and clouds that I just explained. Here, only the meteorite patterns, or they could be seen as stars, make me puzzled because they seem identical to the meteorite patterns or stars decorated on the divine towers appearing in the lands between. As we know, divine towers are a type of architectural structure that can be closely associated with astrologers, and similar to what I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the hypothesis is that astrologers either built or laid the foundation for the structures reaching the sky, or in other words, they were responsible for building this temple or even for the phenomenon of the land of shadow seemingly floating in the sky. If you've ever been to Divine Towers, you'll easily recognize that the elevators leading to the upper floors appear to be floating upwards. Explaining this unusual gravitational phenomenon is quite simple, it's due to the influence of the meteorites attached to the walls of the Divine Towers. Therefore, the close relationship of astrologers with this temple and the Land of Shadow is not surprising. And even, it's very likely that the Divine Towers themselves are the columns that make the Land of Shadow float in the sky, with the presence of General Radon in some capacity, possibly as the prison director. Of course, Divine Towers are ancient architectural structures, existing long before the Land of Shadow was purged and thrown into the sky, so if they serve as the columns to keep the Land of Shadow floating in the sky, then it's possible that people only utilized their gravitational instability recently, at least after the war with the giants ended. Returning to this lion model, it seems that the sun, meteorites, and cloud decorations on its shoulder armor are also among the popular decorative patterns in the lands between. You can search for images of any knight's helm, which seems to also have similar ornate patterns like those on the lion's shoulder armor, for example, the Landal knight helm. Therefore, it can be easily concluded that the symbols of the sun, meteorites, and clouds are obviously not prohibited symbols in the age of the Ur tree. Hence, these elements directly reinforce the hypothesis that this lion dancer boss previously served under the Golden Order, and therefore, on its body, there are appearances of common patterns in the age of the Ur tree. Now, I'll talk about the dancers inside this lion model. In this scene and the subsequent frames, we only see the hands and feet of the dancers. Although we cannot see them fully, based on the thigh and hand parts without signs of fur or horns, they are most likely not omen but rather normal warriors, possibly belonging to the warrior race similar to humans like Godfrey, Nephili Lu, or duelists. Their body proportions appear tall and robust, with the characteristic dark skin of duelists. The only discrepancy seems to be the nails of the dancers compared to those of the duelists, but this is only a relatively minor difference. In the next frame, when our advertisement friend is being tortured by the boss, I'm quite sure there are two dancers inside the lion model. I'll call the dancer controlling the lion's head dancer A, and the dancer controlling the rest of the lion dancer B. 
Before talking about them, I'll discuss the relationship between dualists, Omen, and the Land of Shadow. It seems that dualists were also among the former enemies of the Golden Order. Evidence suggests that dualists were used as tools for entertainment purposes in arenas. In history, specifically during the Roman era, dualists were predominantly slaves and war prisoners captured by Roman legions to serve as gladiators for the amusement of crowds and arenas. Therefore, it is not difficult to conclude that dualists were also prisoners of the Golden Order. Why the Golden Order? If you have ever been to the Sainted Hero's Grave, a dungeon in the original game, you will surely encounter the Grave Warden Duelist, a very special duelist who can only be defeated when led to stand in the glowing circle symbol of the Golden Order. Of course, you can encounter many other duelists throughout the lands between, but it is undeniable that they were once prisoners of the Golden Order. The Ritual Sword Talisman item states, the practice had died out by the age of King Consort Radagon, but remains of the arenas where ritual combat took place can still be found in every land. From this item, we know that duelists once served in arenas, but only until Radagon became the new consort of Queen Marika. This implies that duelists were captured as prisoners when Godfrey was the Elden Lord, and this was also the time when wars for the purpose of building influence and imposing the Golden Order of Queen Marika on other lands were most prevalent, coinciding with the Unsung Battle. Therefore, I believe that duelists were likely one of the factions involved in the unsung battle event. In another scene from the trailer, we can also see an image of a large, bulky character wrapped in chains, casting an incantation spell to create the head of a roaring bear and he might well be a duelist. So, what is the relationship between duelists and omen? As we know, omen are beings, whether human or animal, with markings on their bodies resembling those of other species, considered manifestations of the divine in the era preceding the age of the Erd tree. I won't delve into that further, as it's widely known. However, similar to dualists, Omen also share a vulnerability related to the Golden Order. In the original game, there's an item capable of binding Omen for a period of time, called Margot's Shackle. This item clearly depicts the symbol of the Golden Order on it, and its note states, a fetish bathed in golden magic. Shackles were used to bind the accursed people, called the Omen, and these ones were made to keep a particular Omen under strictest confinement. Though faint, the shackles still retain vestiges of power, enough to trap the once-bound Margot on Earth, if only for a short time. Thus, the Golden Order can be seen as the oppressors of Omen, much like with duelists. Returning to this Lion Dancer boss, we can see that our friend Dancer A controls the lion's mouth and emits a series of dust and stones, which I'm quite certain belong to the Biastral Incantation magic. Then, in the following segment, we see a series of lightning bolts appearing in the boss arena, belonging to the Dragon Cult Incantation. However, when the lion boss jumps to catch one of the lightning bolts, it gets struck instead. This seems to be a mechanism in this boss fight, and the explanation for this is that Dancer A and Dancer B had a lack of coordination. It's likely that Dancer A is the one using Biastral incantations, and Dancer B is using Dragon Cult incantations. When Dancer B creates the lightning bolts, it's also when Dancer A jumps to catch them. If you notice, the advertisement friend is just rushing in without any signs of doing something to counter the lightning bolts, so the only explanation is the lack of synchronization between Dancer A and B in a certain mechanism of the boss fight. In summary, all we know about this Lion Dancer boss is that it's a sorcerer who once served under the Golden Order, using mostly spells from the Biastral and Dragon Cult incantations. Additionally, it's worth mentioning that lions are sacred animals in East Asian beliefs, often sculpted and placed at the entrance of homes to ward off evil spirits, bring luck to the homeowners. During festivals like Tet or Mid-Autumn Festival, lion dances are also performed in hopes of bringing luck in the new year. Therefore, the appearance of this lion dancer boss in this temple could be at guarding the entrance to a certain area of the temple, perhaps an area located on the second tier of the temple. Perhaps the information I previously provided is still not sufficient to prove my hypothesis about the factions involved in the Unsung Battle event. 
Therefore, I'll continue analyzing to make everything clearer. Let's keep watching the video to find out what they are. In summary, according to my inference, we have the Golden Order on one side, under the leadership of Godfrey, Radagon, Godwin, and the Dragons. The opposing faction consists of Omen, Misbegotten, and other races who worship Omen, such as the Duelist race, led by Mesmer. I don't need to reiterate which side wins. Now, before we move on to the next scene, let's listen again to the voice of the female NPC. They were never saints. They just happened to be on the losing side of a war. In this scene, we see something that the game director, Hidetaka Miyazaki, calls the giant basket of flame and describes it as a terrible weapon. In terms of appearance, it bears a striking resemblance to a character named Wicker Man that appeared in the famous Berserk manga series by Kentaro Miura. Of course, that's not the most interesting part about this giant basket of flame. Now, let's look at its body. It seems like this figure has a symbol with a human face adorned at the top, which is presumably its head. What's special is that this decorative with a human face is made up of many omen horns, suggesting that the entity itself may be a product of the omen. Furthermore, this symbol could also remind us of the symbol of the sun. But it doesn't stop there. It's fascinating how the images of this giant basket of flame bear a striking resemblance to a unique character that appeared in the original game, yes, that's none other than the Dung Eater when he sits in round table hold. Look at the fiery red hue on his body, it perfectly matches the color of the flames on the giant basket of flame's body. Moreover, look around the room where he sits, there are many charred corpses, which closely resemble the design of the giant basket of flame with charred bodies contained within it. Even the armor worn by the Dung Eater is closely related to the omen and this giant basket of flame. Look at the sun symbol and omen horns on his armor, you'll see an astonishing similarity in their designs. The item omen armor has the following note, malformed armor resembling an omen with its horns cut off. Worn by the Dung Eater. The heavy, sun-shaped medallion represents both the guidance he once saw and the ring to which it will one day lead. Reading these lines, it's hard not to think that in the past, our friend the Dung Eater may have encountered this giant basket of flame, but could that be the only encounter? Clearly, the similarity in artistic design between the Dung Eater and the giant basket is not coincidental. Personally, I believe that our friend the Dung Eater may have even fought alongside the Omen and against the Golden Order in the Unsung Battle event. It's challenging to prove this point conclusively, except for the similarities in their body structures and the vague notes. Returning to the giant basket of flame, if you pay close attention, you'll notice that its sides are adorned with the heads of giants as a decoration of its conquests. This also contributes to proving that the omen indeed served under the Golden Order and participated in the war against the giants, and what about the dragon head inside the basket? Certainly, that is the remains of a dragon from the Golden Order's ranks after the end of the Unsung Battle event. As we know, after the war with the dragons ended, the Golden Order forged friendships with them, and they fought alongside each other, even in the Unsung Battle, so there's no reason to doubt the background of the dragon head inside this burning basket. But what do all these signify? Personally, I believe it gives us a rough approximation of the timeline of the Unsung Battle event, which is after the war with the giants and certainly with the battle Augeant dragons of the Golden Order. Now, let's move on to another provided image. Here, we can clearly see the giant basket of flame fighting alongside Mesmer's soldiers. Therefore, Mesmer is very likely the leader of the Omen in the Unsung Battle War in the past. This is logical because, as we know, Mesmer was the ruler of the Land of Shadow, which I believe is the homeland of the Omen and Misbegotten. Furthermore, Mesmer himself could very well be an Omen, I have some information and evidence to support this hypothesis, and I'll try to present it in another video. So, if you found this video interesting and enjoyable, please consider subscribing, liking, or sharing it with your friends so they can watch it too. Or leave a generous comment below to encourage me to create even better quality videos. And of course, we'll discuss more about the fascinating theories of this top-notch game together. Now, let's delve into the true reasons behind the event of the Unsung Battle. 
Firstly, from a political perspective, it's clear that after the wars with the giants and dragons, Queen Marika began to bolster the influence of the Golden Order in neighboring lands within the lands between. Anyone or anything opposing the Erdtree would be deemed heretical. And naturally, the Land of Shadow, homelands of the Omen would undoubtedly become victims. The reason is simple, before the age of the Erdtree, the Omen were once considered symbols of divinity. There are numerous items in the original game that directly validate this, and even in the shadow of the Erdtree trailer, we see the divine manifestations of the Omen right within their own temples or with the Lion Dancer boss, revered and worshipped. But that's not all, in another scene from the trailer, we can clearly see our advertisement friend casting butterfly spells, showing us a community seemingly worshipping a tree. Yes, this tree seems to be present all over the land of shadow and even within the omen temple itself, and I'll tentatively call it the omens tree. If you look closely, on either side of this tree are two statues of omen lions seemingly guarding it. Furthermore, you can also compare the artistic design of this tree with the lion dancer boss from earlier, it's easy to notice that the horns of the lion model resemble the branches of the tree, just as its hairstyle resembles the leaves of this tree. Therefore, I have no doubt that this tree is also some sort of divine manifestation revered and preserved by the omen and the misbegotten. Thus, the cause of the unsung battle is undoubtedly due to disagreements in both religion and politics, and the Golden Order could very well be the aggressors. We could say that the unsung battle truly resembled a holy war, and the losing side was associated with the worst things, such as being cursed, turned into slaves like the misbegotten, scorned, or made to become dualists for the amusement of the people in arenas. Simply put, they represented an era of old, an era of the crucible tree, an era of the omens tree, where primal life intertwined in a state of disorder. And as the NPC once said, they were never saints, though short, it encapsulates the essence of the losing side's fate. In my opinion, Mesmer truly is a hero of the omen, given his role, he's like the leader of the lower class people in the age of the Erdtree who rebelled against the invasion of the Golden Order, and it's quite possible that they succeeded in burning the Erdtree once before the entire land of shadow was thrown into the sky. Remember, when we initially viewed the first images of the Elden Ring trailer, we also commented that Radon was the antagonist of Elden Ring, but in reality, it's not quite the case, and perhaps Mesmer is the same. Do you still remember the graveyard area in the capital outskirts at Altus Plateau that I mentioned in the previous video? There are many tombstones with a hole in the surface, and if you haven't seen it yet, you can watch part 1 of the video where I provide the link in the description below. In the previous video, I discussed extensively and concluded that these tombstones belong to the Omen and the Misbegotten due to the remarkable similarity between the patterns on the holes and the items related to the Omen or more precisely, the patterns related to the Crucible. If you have been to Castle Morn, where there is a tombstone with a similar design, then surely you have also visited the sword monuments at the Weeping Peninsula, where it is written on the body of the large sword. The Siege of Castle Morn, a lone hero fights for his vengeance, only to fall at the hand of Lord Godfrey. Therefore, these notes clearly imply that the tombstone inside Castle Morn, revered by the Leonine Misbegotten, is the tombstone of the lone hero mentioned on the sword. I am quite certain that this lone hero is an omen or a misbegotten, most likely a misbegotten. This is quite reasonable, considering that the graveyard of these omen and misbegotten is located right at the capital outskirts, the gateway to Landal capital, where I believe that the event of the Unsun battle partially took place, and of course, the soldiers of our lone hero fell there, only for him to later seek vengeance at Castle Morn. Unfortunately, he clashed with Godfrey there who at the time was the lord of the battlefield. So, do misbegotten appear in the DLC trailer? The answer is yes, that's the black ghost friend wielding the iron cleaver and charging towards our advertisement friend. But anyway, the video has been long enough, and I've already presented my hypotheses surrounding the omen and the land of shadow, their homeland, especially the hypotheses about the unsung battle event and a bit of Mesmer's secrets. See you in the next videos, and if you find this video interesting, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share it with your friends to watch. Thank you very much for your support.